Hi, my name's Sherry Crabtree. I'm a horticulture research and extension associate here at Kentucky State University, and welcome to our pop out orchards. I'm Kirk Popper, and uh, I'm the Dean and Director of the College of Agriculture here at Kentucky State University, but I'm also a professor of horticulture, and I've been working with Paw Paw for about 23 years. Yeah, we'd love to take you on a tour and show you some things that we've been working on. We do a lot of different things related to Paw Paw here at KSU. We do breeding. We're trying to develop new, improved varieties of Paw Paw, so we've released three cultivars so far. KSU Atwood, KSU Benson, and KSU Chappelle. And you all can actually see the original Benson and Chappelle trees in this orchard in a little bit. We can show them to you. But we're continuing to do breeding to try to develop varieties that are disease resistant, that are early ripening, that have good flavor and high yields are some of the things that we're looking for. So for uh, the three that you bred, uh, did each one have a specific thing that you were looking for? Like uh, is one the one that has the, the good flavor and one that has the disease resistance or is it all three a mix of all three things each time? I think it comes out just like apples, you mm -hmm. know, honey crisp apples and red delicious apples. They all have different flavors. And so these three also have, you know, unique qualities that make them distinct. And they also happen to uh, ripen at different times. And so basically, uh, uh, KSU Benson tends to ripen pretty early. Uh, Chappelle kind of mid-season and then KSU Atwood is kind of a late uh, ripening. So you get a, a period of time where you're going to be harvesting pawpaws in the fall and you'll have ripe pawpaws with different flavors. Just for the viewers that might not know about pawpaws, what is the, the timeline for a pawpaw that is ripe in, in America? Yeah. Well, here in Kentucky, usually the end of August, we start seeing our early ripening cultivars getting ripe and we'll go through about the end of September. And so that'd be a little bit earlier, farther south, and later, farther north. But that's generally our season here in Kentucky. They tend to ripen over kind of a long period in the fall because they actually bloom over quite an extended period in the springtime. And so, hence, that's why you've got fruit at different stages. And that's a good thing if you're going out in your backyard, especially, and want to have a pawpaw, you're going to have pawpaws at different times. If you're a commercial producer, it's it's a little more of a pain because you're going out and harvesting all the time. Mm -hmm. It's not like a concentrated ripening period like you might have with an apple or a peach variety. They're kind of funny. One fruit and a cluster, I'm trying to look for a cluster right now, but one fruit and the cluster will ripen and the rest of the cluster is not ripe. So you kind of just have to go through and touch them one by one. They'll also fall on the ground when they're ripe. You'll notice as you walk through the orchard, you'll see some fruit. You might even hear a fruit drop like as yes. we're walking through. So when they're ripe, if you're pick them, picking them, they'll come off easily in your hand or they'll just drop on the sure. ground when they're ripe. So. A lot of times we'll go harvest fruit down a row come back down the other end and then we'll hear fruit drop you know the <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> and how far north do pawpaws grow like i saw ohio like putting up pictures of pawpaws and i was like hey i thought that was kentucky's thing up into um southern new york southern okay. michigan even into southern ontario canada wow so they're okay. hardy to zone five maybe wow. borderline 4b they're hardy to about 25 below fahrenheit well, yeah they will die back sometimes when we get really severe winters uh, we've seen a little bit of that if it gets down to minus 20 which does happen in kentucky and other you know, areas around here and, and and then they will kill back a ways but uh, but they do pretty well i noticed that some of these trees are painted white on the trunks uh, what is the reasoning for that so a real common problem with papa is now uh, it is naturally an understory tree and so it really thrives under under kind of partial shade conditions so when you take a tree like this out into a full sun orchard, which is when, where they're going to produce the most fruit, they do have some stress. And so what we found is in the winter time, they, uh, they de-harden where the sun hits. So the sun from that southwest uh, exposure will actually heat up the bark enough that it loses its winter hardiness. Mm. And so then it gets cold again and it kills that part of the bark. And so you'll see it huh. start girdling the trees. And you'll probably see a few trees here this that have damage. This one is worse, although I think it had more going on than just southwest tree. I see. But yeah, you see how this bad. This is what you mean when you say girdling. Like yeah. you kind of lost this outside yeah. right. um, layer of bark. So if you okay. lose too much of that, a lot of times they'll survive one kind of thin crack, but when mm. it starts going all the way around the trunk, and it's an entry point to diseases also, um, but it just, like you said, it cuts off the vascular system that goes around the trunk too much, so water and nutrients can't flow from Is it just um, 
white paint or is it a special white paint for trees? It's just actually a, a, a latex, mm -hmm. indoor latex uh, white paint. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use the exterior. It's got different substances in it that you don't want to put on the tree. But We yeah. started with 50-50 paint and water and mm -hmm. then found we needed a little bit more paint to get it to last longer to yeah. get thick enough. And people do whitewashes with lime and things like that. That's kind of an yeah. old, older yeah. method of doing the same thing. You can spray it on. You can put it on a backpack sprayer and spray it instead okay. of using a brush. Mm -hmm. This is one thing that we're doing research on. Um, a graduate student is working on right now is um, looking at this disease. You see the black spots on the fruit. Oh. So that's a fungal disease called Phyllosticta. Uh -huh. And it causes a spot on the fruit and on the leaves. You see black spots on some of these okay. leaves also. And um, usually, in a lot of cases, it's just cosmetic. Like this fruit is fine on the outside, although it would not be appealing to a consumer. You know, if you're trying mm -hmm. to sell fruit and they see black spots, they're probably not going to want to buy it. But when you see pretty severe cases like that, see the crack in the fruit. So it can cause the, the fruit to crack because these black areas are kind of brittle. So then as the fruit grows and expands, it causes a crack in the fruit, okay. which again is an entry point for disease and can cause mm -hmm. rot and things inside the fruit. If it's just on the surface, that does not cause any kind of rot. You could cut it open and it's fine on the inside. But when it gets bad, you see this cracking. Is there something that carries the fungal disease from tree to tree? It's really leaf moisture. Okay. So leaf moisture is what the fungal diseases need to yeah. proliferate and the water droplets spread it from leaf to leaf as they splash yeah. and that spread it sense. around. Mm -hmm. So it's always worse in wet years, which has been a pretty wet year. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. So we've been looking at different control measures for it, looking at copper and sulfur that are kind of natural fungicides. Will actually cause a lot of defoliation on some of these trees too. Uh -huh. So it's mm -hmm. not only damaging the fruit, but it's you know, reducing the the, uh, the trees' uh, health, I'll say. Yeah, we have a lot of trees pretty close together, yeah. so there's a lot of inoculum in the orchard. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. one of our projects that we're working on, and we were talking about breeding for disease resistance. That's one of the, the kind of the main disease that we're looking for Absolutely. resistance to. When you mentioned spacing, of in your research, have you found that there's an optimal distance between the trees? We, we kind of started with about an eight foot spacing, and mm -hmm. that's still what we recommend. And you can see you've almost created a hedge. And yeah. There's a number of us who have talked about this. It's it's probably not a bad thing to almost have a hedge production system like this because they, they are an understory tree, so they mm -hmm. get a little shading from the hedge next to them, sure. right? Mm -hmm. And so the, the bigger problem really is between the trees in the alleyways. You can see here, you know, now that they've matured, it's uh, getting difficult to drive down the alleyway. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and so that's something you have to keep pruning. So really 20 feet between the trees in the alleyway is really quite important, but maybe eight to 10 feet between the trees. Okay. And how old are the trees that we're kind of standing in between right now anyway? These were planted in 2004. Okay. So these are 17 years old this year. Papa is not an extremely tall tree. It's a fairly small to medium sized tree, but we do prune these to keep them a little bit smaller. Um, you can probably see, yeah, you can see on this one where we made that cut right there I and see. cut the central leader, the part that would grow straight up. So as they start to get taller, we will remove the central leader to kind of encourage them to grow a little bit wider and not as tall so it's easier to harvest from. But even yeah. if we didn't do that, pawpaws get 20 to 30 feet tall. And you don't want to get hit in the head from a uh, right. pawpaw tree 20 feet up. Yeah, makes sense. Yes, makes sense. exactly. <laughs> Besides the fungal aspect, are there any pests that are, uh, you know, specialized with pawpaw or a, a pretty big nuisance for this orchard? We don't have a lot of pest problems, you know, pawpaw being a native plant, it's well adapted to this area. So there's not as many pest and disease problems as there are for um, non-native plants. Uh, we do see, again, the black spot in the fruit that we showed you. There are a few insects that we see occasionally. The pawpaw peduncle borer, which got its name, the peduncle is actually the stem that attaches the flower oh. to the tree and now the fruit to the tree. Okay. So in the spring, it burrows into that stem of the flower and makes the flower shrivel up and wilt mm. and die mm. basically. But it has several generations per year and it apparently likes all parts of the pawpaw <laughs> because it also <laughs> will bore into the twigs sometimes, not often, but sometimes you'll see a hole like in uh -huh. the small twigs. And they will also get in the fruit 
we've counted and they were in about three to five percent of the fruit okay. so that's not a level that you would worry about spraying or anything like that for but something you know you want to look out for the frass mm -hmm. which is basically the insect droppings basically coming out of the fruit so like the brown powdery stuff on the outside of the fruit would indicate there's an insect inside. So there's that, there is the Asemina webworm, um, the genus name for pawpaw is Asemina, so that's where it gets its name, kind of like fall webworms mm -hmm. that uh -huh. builds a, a nest, a web, kind of at the tips of branches oh, yeah. and have larvae inside that feed. There is the sphinx, pawpaw sphinx moth, which I think we've seen just very few times. Japanese beetles will get on them a little bit mm -hmm. in the summer, but not very much. They, there's other crops that they prefer but a lot more. Right. So they're relatively, as far as fruit trees go, they're pretty insect and disease free. I'll see some leaf roller too sometimes, mm -hmm. which some years can be worse than others. I worried when we first started the papa orchards that we would have like raccoons and possums mm -hmm. coming from everywhere in the county to come to this orchard to yeah. eat papas. But it really never has happened that we, you know, we have our, our little population of raccoons and possums that come and eat but it's never exploded and uh, okay. and so it's yeah it's not too big a problem. Deer are a bigger problem in the winter time and they'll when they're running when they're when they're basically uh, trying to get the velvet off their horns. Do they like to rub the trees? They'll rub the trees. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest problem. Probably. I know that they look pretty but I'm sure these ribbons have some other meaning behind them. That's um, for the graduate students project that we were talking about with um, looking for the different sprays to control for the phyllostic to fungus. So it just indicates different treatments. So she had copper at high and low levels, sulfur at high and low levels, um, control that weren't treated with anything, and another fungicide that at two different levels. So it just indicates her different treatments for her study. So she would mark a cluster of fruit or a, a cluster of leaves that she sprayed and then record how much disease coverage was on the fruit or on the leaves. She actually took digital pictures of the of the leaves and is going by kind of pixel by pixel yeah. how much damage there was to cool. the leaves. So cool. Yeah. But I guess you know each year uh, you never quite know how large a harvest we're going to have. It's really quite determined by uh, by the spring frosts. Really, what it comes down to. And and in Kentucky we get a lot of those April frosts and yeah. sometimes they. You know, this year maybe it's about 70% we thought maybe of a normal crop. I don't know what a normal crop really is. Is there a <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but But some years, you know, we've, we've really truly lost everything and maybe had mm -hmm. like 30 fruit in the entire orchard. So that does wow. happen some years, but not, you know, they do flower over an extended period of time in the spring. So that's a good thing with pawpaw because you will have a few flowers. Hopefully they'll have a few fruit even if you do get a major frost event. Last year that happened, we had a freeze what was it, May 6th or 7th, so a very late remember freeze, that. and everything had finished blooming, so there weren't yeah. any more late blooms really to come on and set fruit. So last year we had, like you said, maybe 30 fruits That's on the entire crazy. farm. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so this orchard is, is made up of, uh, it's, it's mainly two varieties in most of the rows, and then on the further over it's more selection rows. and. Uh, but this was looking at different varieties of pawpaw on different seedling rootstock, and so mm -hmm. we we and we also tried different pruning methods. Of whether we leave them kind of unpruned or if we prune them more like an apple tree. Further up on the other side of the hill, we have a a, a seedling orchard, which basically is the result of crosses that our graduate students and that we have done, and so that's kind of that next hopefully generation of pawpaw varieties out there, and that will hopefully some will get a name, you know, and not be just bulldoze down but, right. uh, we're always looking for the next best pawpaw you know because uh, just like as i said with apples there are many different varieties there's always going to be another variety of pawpaw that, with different characteristics that's going to be desirable too in your mind what do you think is the next desirable thing that you want for a pawpaw variety so that came up at our field day recently because you know there's 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 things that you have to have in a pawpaw and, one of them is that you know it does have to good, a good flavor. It can't have an aftertaste. Mm -hmm. uh, they it should be less than at least ten percent seed. Five percent seed is the best. So a, a lot of pulp and not a lot of seed. Some of the things that we would like to have that we just don't have right now are firmness because mm -hmm. right now as they begin to soften, they bruise pretty easily. And so if you've ever tried to ship pawpaws, and we have long distances in the mail. There's no packaging that you can really do once a pawpaw is soft that won't result in it arriving bruised. Yeah. So if we could find firmness, and, and Susquehanna is a variety that's a little firmer than the rest, but it's not firm enough. And right. so 
there may be some, you know, that's the importance of genetic diversity out there in the wild somewhere, and that's why we'd like to go on some more collecting trips. Is there a really firm pawpaw that we could bring back and then use as a, a parent in a breeding program? From the time that you start the research, how long does it actually take to have a named variety like the Atwood, like the Vincent? I'm sure that it's, sure it's a, a process. <laughs> yeah, some take longer than others. So the Atwood, you know, I, it really, it only took about 10 years, mainly mm -hmm. because it had already been selected, at least as an initial seedling, and gone out and then went through the trials. You know, it really, if you look at apple, it takes about 20 years, and so that's mm -hmm. kind of the same probably for pawpaw or even a little longer. Mm -hmm from across to the seed, to the tree, to grow it up, and then go propagate it, make sure that the, the it reproduces and has the same characteristics, and so it takes quite a while. One other really great characteristic we'd like to have in Papa is if it would actually be a certain color yellow, let's say, that would tell us that it's ripe, so we don't have to go and feel all that fruit, right? right? And so that would be called a color break, and unfortunately, there are some pawpaws that turn just a little yellow when they start to ripen, but it's not a real high correlation between it being fully ripe and having that color. But there are some yellow pawpaws out there, so if anybody ever sees a really yellow pawpaw, we'd be interested. And uh, and that's something we would also like to select for. I heard it here first, yellow firm pawpaw. <laughs> <laughs> it would revolutionize the industry. <laughs> Yeah, like these are starting to get soft and you see they're completely green even when they're ripe. They're ripe, green. yeah. So, um, like Dr. Popper said, some of them do turn a little bit yellow, some of them turn more yellow than others, but that's a little soft and it's still completely green. And again, harvesting is kind of by touch since you don't have a good color to look at either. Mm -hmm. They drop on the ground or come off in your hand or you squeeze them. It's similar to a peach, a ripe peach mm -hmm. um, will be a little bit soft when they're ripe and um, they have a short shelf life when they're ripe. So when they're fully ripe and soft, they only keep a couple of days, two or three days at room temperature. So you can refrigerate them to keep them a little bit longer. You can pick them when they're just starting to get barely ripe. If you pick them and they're completely hard, like there's some of these in the cluster that are just hard as a rock, that will not ripen off the tree. That would never ripen if you picked it. Mm -hmm. But if it's just starting to get a little bit soft, then it's at the stage where it's starting to begin the ripening process and it will ripen off the tree, but it will store a little bit longer at that point, being firmer. So you can put them in the refrigerator at that stage, and we process and freeze them. Freezing is the best way to store them long term. So you want to remove the skin. We just cut them in half and scoop out the insides. Then, depending on how many you're processing, when we just processed a few, we would use like a mesh bag and just put that flesh in the mesh bag and squeeze it through to separate the seeds. You can use a food mill a colander or push it through a colander with a spoon. Uh, now we use a bigger kind of commercial type food mill, but we still have the step where we need to remove the peel. There's not a good way. A lot of fruits and vegetables, you can blanch them and slip the skin off, mm -hmm. but pawpaw that doesn't work very well. The skin is really bitter and mm -hmm. it doesn't fully come off when you blanch it. So mm -hmm. that's some of the difficulties in, in processing it. And um, like Dr. Pomper said, they don't ship well so really processing and freezing and either the frozen fruit or value-added products made out of pawpaws are yeah, the best way to get it out, you know, ship long distances or nationwide. In Kentucky, we have the wineries and breweries and distilleries. Those are the products that have really taken off with pawpaw. There's several breweries in the state that have done like a seasonal pawpaw beer. Um, there's a couple of wineries in the state that make pawpaw wine and um, pawpaw brandy at Jephtha Creed Distillery. So oh, wow. there's quite a few pawpaw products like that mm -hmm. on the market. Um, pawpaw ice cream, pawpaw jam, those are some of the, the most popular things out there you can make out of pawpaw. It, it tastes somewhat similar to banana, so you can use them in recipes similar to how you'd use a banana, like banana bread, banana muffins, things like that, you can substitute pawpaw for in baked goods like mm -hmm. that. And, and some of those varieties are better for processing than others. Uh, you know, we've, we've got some, like Shenandoah is a, a commercially available pawpaw, and it's very banana-like, and mm -hmm. so it's not very strong. And Susquehanna is really a really strong flavor. Atwood would be another strong mango-flavored oh. variety. Yeah. And they're really good for processing because that flavor really, you know, is maintained. And whenever you're processing anything, you will lose a little mm -hmm. flavor and aroma. And so sure. starting with something that has more is a better thing. But... Uh, some of the, the beer makers, they're making a, a pawpaw beer sour, 
recipe, oh, which is ooh, something good. that Sig Lusher has been doing down here in Tim Lusher, and and uh, and so there are. I think there's there's definitely a lot of appeal right now for those value added products, and uh, it's not just chefs looking for the frozen pulp because we already know that market's there, but a lot of this is is that beer market, that distilling market, and and jams and jellies mm -hmm. too. Oh, so this is the original um, KSU Chappelle tree. So this was originally what we call a guard tree. Dr. Pomper talked about this being a watch out for the bees on oh. that. that fruit is cracked. Oh, there's some bees on yeah. it. So, uh, don't grab no. <laughs> You don't want to grab that. <laughs> See, that's another bad thing about cracking is mm -hmm. the bees and wasps get into the crack and then when you're picking it, you could accidentally grab it, which oh. you don't want to do, obviously. Um, Thank you for that. <laughs> yes, yeah, I saw your hand getting close to the bees. I was worried. He would have grabbed it. <laughs> yeah. So this was a seedling. This was originally just like a border row of this experimental planting, and we noticed that it had good fruit on it, and um, just kind of kept an eye out for a few years and tasted it and collected some data on it, and saw you know it has large fruit, really good tasting fruit. It's also an extremely vigorous growing tree. That's one of the outstanding things about KSU Chappelle is it propagates really well and it grows very quickly and vigorously. In addition to have really nice good tasting fruit so anyway this was just a seedling just by chance that we noticed in the guard row of this orchard and went through the process of propagating more trees and having them in variety trials in different locations to collect additional data off of it and then we named named it KSU Chappelle after Roy Chappelle who is a KSU alumni he was a Tuskegee Airman we try to name all of our cultivars after people who are important to KSU history um, so we released this in 2018. This was our most recent cultivar release. You said pawpaws don't live uh, super long. What's the normal life of a pawpaw tree in general? Uh, I, you know, I'm going to say it's similar to peach, okay. which is also not real long lived. So, you know, by the time you get to a 20 year old orchard, you know, like we're almost here, hmm. uh, you're going to start losing a few each year. and. Uh, I think that Neil Peterson also had a, a fairly old orchard in University of Maryland. He th he thought he was losing several, maybe two, three percent a year okay. after they got to 20 years old. And so, okay. really, we want to start rotating out. You've already seen that we've rotated out some trees as we've gone along that are uh, you know not doing real well. We'll just take them out and put a replacement tree in. But uh, but that is something. It's not going to be like a vineyard where you're going to mm -hmm. have a, a hundred year old pawpaw orchard yeah. that's not going to happen. Yeah. And they're definitely shorter lived. If on poorer soils we have another orchard where it's more shallow soils and there's a lot of big limestone floaters, big limestone right. rocks mm -hmm. just a few feet down in the soil that um, make it a really shallow soil and you can see trees in those areas die pretty quickly so better soils and deeper soils and better care of the tree if you keep it well watered and fertilized and take good care of it they'll live longer. Do you have any problems with root suckers? Uh, I know that most of the time I see them in the forest as thickets almost. What's a root sucker? Yeah. So pawpaws do have a tendency to send up shoots from the roots so they'll mm. send out their root system mm -hmm. and send up um, shoots that become little trees from the oh, roots. Oh okay yeah. yeah. Um, we uh, prune those out so we either if they come mm -hmm. up in the aisle we would mm -hmm. weed eat or prune them out and they would get mowed in the aisleways but yes in the mm -hmm. wild they form huge patches that are mm -hmm. are all from one root system all clonal because they're it looks like hundreds of trees but mm -hmm. it's all shoots from one big root system that's so, love and that. that's kind of ties into why they're shorter lived in the mm -hmm. wild they just constantly mm -hmm. regenerate themselves mm -hmm. by sending up these new shoots in the patch and the oldest tree may die off but you've got hundreds of more shoots from the root system that are there to keep growing and kind of keep the patch alive. Awesome. And orchards, we don't want that. One, we don't want no. them competing for resources, for water and nutrients from the main tree. And when they're grafted trees like this, of course, the shoots that come up from the roots are going to be the root stock instead of the main variety. So they wouldn't have the same fruit. They oh, might have more okay. quality fruit. Sometimes you'll find these wild pawpaw patches at the higher elevations mm -hmm. and the hills and it's kind of funny because they probably started off lower kind of near the streams and sometimes you'll have little you know creeks that occasionally run that they probably worked their way up so i kind of like looking at it as like a, a bunch of like 
little stems marching up you know, <laughs> over the course of 100 years. Yeah. And, and so there's no pawpaw patch left down here. You know, it's marched up the hill right. and that's where it is. And that's probably why there are some of those high pawpaw patches up in the mountains. They yeah. follow that water wow. and uh, kind of marched along. Yeah. We were talking about the ripening seasons and everything. And I know that you said that sometimes it ripening through the different seasons can make it harder for production. Is there any positives to that as well? Does that extend your selling time if you were going to have an orchard? Because then you could be having product from the beginning of August to the end of September instead of just one big load. I think for a lot of people it would be, I mean, for a homeowner, absolutely. And for a small farmer that's selling at the farmer's market, yeah. I think it is larger scale orchards kind of want to go through and, and strip Do it all a tree and like pick a whole block. Okay. You know, they'll have a block of a certain type of apple that all ripens at the same time and want to pick it all in a short period. But I think for the small scale producer, it's appealing because like you said, you extend your season. You don't have all your fruit all at once, mm -hmm. especially with it having a short shelf life yeah. to have to do something with. It's kind of mm -hmm. spreads it out over a month long or so season. So this is the original KSU Benson. And this is the seedling also, even though we were talking about the rest of the trees in this orchard sorry. being grafted, but the graft on this tree died and the oh. seedling rootstock came up. And again, we just noticed that the seedling rootstock had really nice fruit. So Benson is early ripening. It's our earliest ripening variety. And you notice the fruit are pretty round. That's one of the unusual things about Benson is it has these round kind of baseball shaped fruit on them, which is good for percent seed. You have a, a higher percent of the the flesh of the fruit mm -hmm. compared to the seed on a round fruit. They seem like they have the least amount of fungus on it too. Yeah, I think Benson and Atwood both are somewhat disease resistant. Mm -hmm. Chappelle, unfortunately, I like Chappelle, mm -hmm. but we see, do see that fungal disease on that. But yeah, Benson and Atwood are a little bit more resistant to it, not fully. So KSU Benson was named for Harold R. Benson, who was our land grant director, our longest serving land grant director at KSU for 37 years he was land grant director at KSU so we named this one in honor of him. Atwood was named for Rufus B. Atwood who was a long-serving president of KSU. Uh, how often, uh, I'm with Kentucky summers and everything, like how often does this pawpaw orchard need to be watered? Mature plantings like this, really only if there's a drought. I don't know okay. if they ran, I don't think they ran the irrigation in this orchard at all this summer. Mm -hmm. Newly planted trees need to be irrigated regularly, at least once a week if you're getting some rain, but a couple of times a week if you're in a drought okay. while they get their roots established, you know, mm -hmm. recover from being transplanted and get their roots established. But mature trees like this, they have a tap root that goes down pretty deep and we would only irrigate if there was a drought. It is really important if you're starting an orchard to remove the, the grass and the weeds from around the tree and put out irrigation like this. If you either, either use this type of emitter system or T-tape or just bring buckets of water out, that's really important the first couple of years as they send that tap root down. And they often don't look very happy the first year. They often Aww. look, you know, kind of transplant shocked and uh, it may be two, three years before they really look good, but then after that, then they have that deep taproot established and they do quite well. So yeah, this orchard, we do use herbicide and we use glyphosate in this orchard, but we do have pawpaws in the organic part of the farm. Mm. You can use wood chip mulch and straw mulch or just mechanical mm. cultivation to control weeds also. We're looking at using tree tubes. Um, young pawpaws do need a little protection from the sun mm. and they do seem to do better having tree tubes that provide some shade and protection for the first year or two. You want to make sure they've got holes in them. We've used tree tubes in the past that were solid and got too hot inside and created mm -hmm. almost like a greenhouse. So, but um, the tree tubes that have lots of slits and holes in them, um, we had better survival with those. Does that help to deer your deer problem as well? It, it can, it can. And it, you know, the best thing to do is actually plant, like, say in March, put the tree tube on and maybe kind of past the point with the deer, you never know. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, honestly, you can probably pull the tree tube back off in late July or early July, even if it's really getting warm, because that you're giving it that little greenhouse effect for that short period of time that's yeah. really giving it the best start up. So deer, deer will go after pawpaw trees. As I said, they will, they will find trees. They will girdle them completely. <laughs> yeah. I think of anything we haven't covered. I wish we would see a zebra swallowtail butterfly. Oh. There is a butterfly, a black and white swallowtail that has an exclusive host relationship with pawpaw. Pawpaw is the only plant that the larvae of the zebra swallowtail feed on. 
And so a lot of people plant pawpaws if they have butterfly gardens just to attract that type of butterfly. Mm. And I'm surprised we haven't seen any flying around. Usually you see quite a few of them in the orchard. Maybe because it's gotten a little bit cooler, so they may not be as active. Um, but yeah, the zebra swallowtail is another nice nice benefit to the pawpaw tree. I keep, so whenever I see a butterfly fly by, I turn, but it's always been something else. We get questions all the time from people wanting to know more information about how to grow a pawpaw orchard, how to get more information and we always try to direct them back to KSU. So if anyone has any questions about, uh, say, specifically cultivating pawpaws, purchasing the Atwood and Benson varieties, where should they go? We do have a nursery list on our website. Um, so if you go to KSU's website, which is kysu.edu, there's a section on pawpaws in there, and we have a nursery list for places you can purchase pawpaw trees. We have a licensed propagator list for the nurseries that are licensed to propagate and sell our cultivars. The Kentucky Division of Forestry also sells pawpaw seedlings, and I don't think they're on our list right now, but they sell, especially if you want large amounts, because they sell bundles mm -hmm. of like 10 or 100 seedlings that are lower cost through the Division of Forestry. Occasionally we will have a international pawpaw conference. I think we've had three, I want to say, through the years of 20 years. So we're probably looking down the line, we'll see. It may be in Ohio before it comes back here, but there are a lot of uh, opportunities for folks to learn more about Papa. Check out our website, check out our third Thursday in September. And then there's also quite a few you know, extension bulletins about how to grow Papa and uh, how to process it. There's videos, uh, your video, of course, that people can go out and check out. And so, yeah, I think there's just a lot of interest in Papa. It's a really fun fruit to work with and to have uh, at the house or at your farm and a lot of things you can do with it. Well, thank you for coming to visit us here in the pawpaw orchards at Kentucky State University. And I hope you'll come out and maybe uh, spend some time with us at a field day or other event. And we'd love to have you visit. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>